I think I'm set. Um, let me know if you are not hearing me or you do not um, see the slides. Um, thank you, Trey. I want to appreciate the, um, your remarks. Uh, I should note that this was put together with Rachel Rosen at MDRC and Eric Brunner, who's my co-author at UConn. Um, first, to talk a little bit about what we mean when we say counterfactual. Um, while um, Trey is talking a lot about various approaches to identifying the causal effects of programs, if we step back, the question we often want the answer to isn't exactly necessarily the causal effect that has been estimated. More specifically, one might think that what we want to really capture is what if we took some program and delivered it to a broad population how would that change the experiences of the people in that population? And that essentially the experiences of that population that would have occurred if there hadn't been treatment, that's our counterfactual. And then when we're having this type of perspective, there are three issues that I think Trey again has already exposed you to, which we'll refer to as internal validity, external validity, and then formally a, the counterfactual. Um, and those three issues are really the topic of this discussion today. And of course, you should feel free to interrupt at any time. Um, Kathy, if someone sends something to the chat, um, let me know. Or people, if you can just unmute your mics and jump in, that would be fine also. Um, so the key issue on internal validity, which I'm sure you've already discussed, is this idea of selection into and out of the program. The people who end up being treated by a program are different than the people who um, might not have been treated by the program. And that, that means that you have to be very careful if you have a group of people who are treated to come up with what might be viewed as a suitable control group, right? That we want to compare career and technical education participants to some control group of students who had a different experience and hopefully uncover the effects of CTE. Um, of course, there is a lot of problems with that, right? Is Of course, the people who, are, who experience CTE may be different. And so these differences at unobservables create a problem for internal validity. It also could be that the exposure, if you're looking across places or environments, the exposure to CTE differs. For example, um, CTE capacity might be adjusted to historic demand. So the places that have more CTE are actually places where the people are different than the people who have less CTE. And also when, case, when there's a case of oversubscription, there's limited access to CTE electives. Oftentimes in many cases, there's an informal process. And so we don't know exactly how people were sorted into CTE and how other individuals who might have asked to participate have been turned down. So there's some of the examples of threats to internal validity that we might try to address by approaches like interrupted time series, diff and diff, or a regression discontinuity analysis, or again, a randomized control trial. The second issue we're talking about today is external validity. Um, there are a variety of contexts in which CTE is delivered, right? So CTE is delivered within traditional schools, sometimes in supplemental centers, and sometimes in standalone schools. If you look at the total number of kids exposed to CTE, probably a large majority of those kids were exposed to CTE within their traditional schools. And that's certainly where the bulk of the um, federal funds go. Um, to support CTE education. But if you look at where most of the evaluations have been done, well, where can you have an opportunity to do a very good evaluation? Often when there's some type of application process and you often have well-defined application processes when, there's, um, when there are you know, sort of separate academies within the school that you apply to or standalone schools that you apply to. And so we have good evaluation evidence in those contexts, but that might not be externally valid. It might not apply to the way most of the cases where students are experiencing CTE. Another classic example of external validity issues is when there are heterogeneous effects across students. So for example, if we have selection into the program, 
that it may be, even with a randomized control trial, that both the treatment and the control group students are different than the broad population that might be treated if we decide to take a program to scale. And if that selected population of volunteers volunteered, for example, because they expected to get a very large return, then it might be that the estimated causal effects with very high internal validity might provide a very misleading um, ev um, suggestion of what's really going to happen when we take this program to scale because the program was small, it was standalone, it operated on volunteers in a very, um, very specific circumstance, and so it didn't have good external validity. And the final issue I want to talk about is what we've referred to um, as, you know, the counterfactual issue within the broad counterfactual paper. And that's the experiences of the control group relative to CTE students. Uh, one of the classic issues here that's certainly been a challenge for some of the work that's been going on in New York City is that oftentimes when a student fails to get into a career in technical education program they want to get into, they have other options for obtaining access to CTE. And if they can go and get CTE somewhere else, then their experiences actually of the control group might not be that different than the experiences of the individuals who maybe won the lottery and got into their CTE program of choice. And if that's the case, you may be with good internal validity measuring the causal effects of a very, very small treatment. There was a big federal program called the Moving to Opportunity where they gave vouchers to public housing recipients. And those vouchers allowed people to move to low poverty rate neighborhoods. But the treatment was actually pretty small because during that time frame, there was a lot of changes in public housing, a move towards vouchers, and many people who wanted vouchers had other ways to gain access to vouchers over the seven or eight years um, that followed the program. Another important question to ask about the counterfactual is, is that perhaps the experiences of the control group are actually different from what the experiences of the treatment group would have been if they hadn't been treated, right? So it, if, you don't have a, if you don't have an RCT, it might be in fact that there are some subtle differences between the treatment and the control group. And even if you're able to control for those differences in terms of, of estimating the effect of the program, it might be that, um, that still you're not sure what you're measuring because you don't really know what experiences the treatment group would have had. It may have been that they would have had more CTE than the control group would have had, even if they hadn't been treated, for example, because of their own choices, um, because of their desire to sort of pursue CTE, for example. And finally, the program itself may sort of change choices within the control group. If you, if you um, learn about this program, perhaps we launch a small CTE program, it raises the salience of CTE, and suddenly the control group are doing things that they wouldn't have done if there never was such a program. So the next question, so we want to do a little bit of methods here, but I think you've seen a lot of this. This is just a little bit of math where we're talking about um, looking at an expectation or an average of outcomes for a treatment group will label one and a control group will label zero. And there are many ways to try to estimate a treatment, group, a treatment effect. The first is simply conditioning on observables. And during the last period, you learned a lot about the problems with that. Um, Kathy, can you interrupt and keep me on time? Because when I shared my screen, I lost the clock on my computer. Oh, yep, yeah, I'll do that. What time, how much time have I used? I think we started at 22 after. Uh, it's it's 3.30, so you still have 30 minutes. Ah, so you're happy. I'm making up for the fact you're running late again. Okay, that's good. Yeah, no, we <laughs> you can do that to me you. every time. <laughs> Would you like 40 minutes, Steve? We'll give you okay. 40 minutes. We'll just, we'll just delete the break from the schedule. How about that, Chinese? <laughs> um, okay, 
So moving right. on, we have um, conditioning on observables, which basically means in some cases running something like a regression where we condition the outcomes on some set of observables or a matching operator where we say, let's compare two people who are very, very similar in some way, who perhaps we predict to have the same probability of participating in the program. Those are often the ways matching takes place. Um, but those leave the problem of selection on unobservables, which of course is a lot of what you talked about in the last section. There are a number of approaches in dealing with this. The first, which is often referred to as instrumental variables, is to try to identify some type of exogenous shock to treatment. So let's say there's two, in, two, two groups of individuals. Some have exposure to some type of subsidy. Others don't. We'll call that subsidy Z. And if we simply compare the people who have randomly have access to the subsidy to those who don't, then we might actually get the overall effect of the subsidy on outcomes. And if we assume that primarily the subsidy operates by causing more people to take up the subsidy, well, we can look at the effect of the subsidy on T, which is the fraction of the people who participate. So let's say, for example, without the subsidy, 20% of the people participate. With the subsidy, 70% of the people participate. That's about a 0.50. Now, if we take um, the effect of the subsidy on treatment and divide it by 0.5 or double it, that is what we think of as a treatment on the treated. That's the effect of the instrument, the subsidy, scaled by how much effect the subsidy has on treatment. Um, and that's often referred to as an instrumental variables approach. But you need some type of exogenous shock. Another alternative, which you've all learned about a little bit today, is a regression discontinuity. Again, we're going to condition, compare people who are similar, condition on X. But of course, if a condition to be similar on X, they may differ on unobservables. So what we want to do is we want to exploit some discontinuity in admissions. So it might be, for example, if you get above some threshold, you get treated. And if you're below some threshold, you're not treated. And even though the X's have some very nonlinear relationship between, between um, with outcomes, if we look for a discontinuity at this C and pull out any smooth differences along this score that gets you admitted, then we can essentially identify the effects through a discontinuous shock. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on when we do when we do the talk about rd more specifically but the idea is if the world is relatively smooth then the only thing that should happen at the discontinuity is that a bunch of extra people get in because they cross the threshold and that essentially operates like a treat a random treatment once you pull out this smooth effect of moving across the threshold and then finally, if we have lottery admissions or randomized treatment, it's very clean because all we have is we have to measure the, the effects for the treatment group, measure the average for the control group, and take the difference. Now, what we're going to do to think about the counterfactuals in these contexts is to look at four different case studies. Um, the first was the California Linked Learning District Initiative, which was basically conducted by controlling on observables, including matching. An instrumental variables approach where the exogenous shock is distance to the academy that provided CT, the career academy. A regression discontinuity approach, which is my recent paper with Eric Brenner and Sean Dougherty. And then the MDC, very famous MDC study of lottery admissions to career academies that were embedded within, standalone career academies that were embedded in high schools. Talking quickly about each of these four, linked learning, districts applied. Um, they were then selected for the program because of having a demonstrated track record, having a high share of disadvantaged and minority students. The goal was to create certified linked learning pathways. Over nine districts, they created 46 pathways. The control sample was all other students um, in, can't read my own slides because that's the way this works. Um, Give me a second. Uh, 
well, I don't, not very good at formatting on Zoom, sorry. So the control group is all their students in the district and the administrative data was analyzed using both regression analysis and scoring where we compare people who on their observables look like they're equally likely to have participated in CTE. Uh, the problem is that in this case, there are several important threats to internal validity. The first is we don't know what schools these students would have attended if they had not been selected as pathway or chosen to be pathway participants. For example, the control group is all students in the district, but districts have multiple high schools. They also have several choice high schools, magnet schools, many options for students. If instead of controlling for all students in the district, we just control for traditional high schools, which is where many of these CTE pathways were based and likely where students would have remained if they hadn't done CTE, then the effects actually fall from 13 to 11 points. Might fall further if we were to recognize the fact that often students, very often students don't just select any pathway in the district, but they're likely to remain at their home school. And when they remain at their home school, then they pick a pathway from what's available in their home school. In that case, controlling for students at their school might be a better control group than the students across the district. Of course, even within school, pathway students may differ from non-pathway students on observables and unobservables. And here it's relatively striking if we look at the high school graduation effects for the linked learning study, the estimates without controlling for student attributes, the small number of observed student attributes like free lunch, um, having an IEP, um, minority status, what we find is that estimates fall from 11 percentage point increase in high school graduation to only five. One then needs to wonder if we could have seen parental education, if we could have seen parental involvement in the student's education, if we could have seen other family background information, these five points might have fallen substantially more. Uh, another key issue is that existing quality pathways were likely very good candidates, were the primary candidates for certification. And so another question is, in terms of the internal validity, is are we really measuring the effect of participating in these pathways that would have likely existed anyway, or are we truly measuring the effect of the program itself that certified these pathways? We don't really know whether it's a certification, the LLDI, or whether it's the pathways themselves that actually in many cases pre-existed the program. Next, I'd like to talk about Chicago Public Schools. This is the instrumental variable study. The idea is that students get close um, to a school, they're more likely to choose a school. And so being close to a career academy means you're more likely to go to a career academy. They didn't find effects for attending non-neighborhood schools or high-performing schools, but they did find effects for career academies. They found that if you were closer to a career academy, your graduation Morning. rates were higher. And that equated basically to attending a career academy, raising um, tests, raising um, graduate high school graduation rates by five percentage points. Okay, so there are a lot of issues here, some internal and some external. Location may affect performance directly. This is the idea that we're going to violate this instrument. We're going to say it's not just distance driving it through, um, through, through treatment, but possibly directly. And so when we scale up by the treatment effects, we could be getting too large an effect. So distance matters, but we don't know how much of it is CTE. Maybe none of it's CTE. Maybe kids just do better when they're near the schools they tend to attend. School choice may also have other effects, like improving peers. There are some evidence in this study because, of course, they did not find any effects of choice at the high-performing peer schools where PERS would have been better. And they also looked for peer effects in the career academy and didn't find any. Another critical estimate of an IV study of this type where we scale by the effects of the 
instrument, in this case distance on treatment, is the IVs only identified by compliers, those where distance actually affects treatment. The issue here is most of the students never choose a, career, a choice, choice school, and even more of them never choose a career academy. And so there's a whole bunch of students who, even if they were very close to a career academy, they wouldn't go. And so there's a small number of, quote, compliers who, if you were to move them closer to the career academy, they would comply, they would attend the career academy. These compliers are likely students with very strong preferences. And so we're really estimating this not for a broad population of students, but for students with very strong preferences for attending the career academy, strong enough to give up their home school. Um, there was no documentation of what we'll call the counterfactual experiences of the control group because this IV study was really about school choice, not about um, ab about CTE, but it does help illustrate some of the internal external validities that can arise in an IV study. The next case study we're talking about is a regression discontinuity. We have a large technical high school system, standalone schools admitted based on a scoring system. We've, they, we find large effects where um, essentially a, gaining admission and then attending the technical high school raises graduate high school graduation rates by 10% and earnings in young adulthood by over 30%. Even better, and this goes to the counterfactual experience, these effects are larger in high schools if someone would have gone to a high school that has limited CTE options. That gets to the counterfactual, right? If someone is attending a high school, um, would have attended a high school that was, had very little CTE, and then they get in, we get larger effects of getting in than if someone didn't. Um, so key issues with RD tend to be less about internal validity and more about external validity. The treatment effect is estimated for students who are near this admissions boundary. Essentially, we look on one side of the admissions boundary and we see these higher graduation rates. And on the other side, we see lower graduation rates. And this, these, this large discontinuity in outcomes can't be explained by sort of simple trends in how students do as their score improves. And so moving above the threshold seems to have an effect on outcomes. But of course, most of the students are nowhere near the threshold. That means this evidence is, is not very helpful or may not be very, very helpful if we want to go out and convince other states to set up a standalone CTE system because this is only relevant for these marginal students. But it could be very helpful if we're trying to convince Connecticut state policymakers to expand, expand the system and let more students in. It's notable, however, that we have minimal evidence of heterogeneity across students, including over the score. And so what that suggests is that at least Within our variation, there doesn't seem to be a lot of heterogeneity that would create a problem for external validity. We do have some rough evidence on the counterfactual. The model examines the extent of CTE options for students who are not admitted. We mentioned that based on sort of course offering differences. That cannot explain the entire effect, and so some of it must be due to the standalone nature of the schools. Integrated curriculum, oops, sorry, work-based learning. However, again, as I noted very early on, this standalone school is very different than experiences of most CTE in the US. And so more broadly, this study has limited external validity to talk about where most, um, the experiences of most students in the US. Um, how much time do I have left? Kathy, what time is it? It is 3.48. Okay. I and we're giving might, you some extra. So. But I might actually finish on time. I've been going pretty quickly. Are there any questions people have so far? I haven't seen anything in the chat box, but um, okay. I see faces nodding. People okay. are there. But please do um, ask Steve any questions you have. Okay, so let's keep going. 
Um, the final one, and this is why we actually probably will give you some of your break, um, help you catch up, help Kathy catch up, is the MDRC study of career academies. These were small career focused learning communities within traditional high schools. And they looked at three cohorts of students, but starting in night, entering in 93, 94, 95, often usually entering either in ninth or 10th grade. This was, of course, a set of volunteers. People applied, they volunteered to be part of the learning community, and then they had random assignment where some students were admitted and some students were not. Um, high school completion was the same for the treatment and control group, but in most of these high schools, the graduation rate was very high, unlike in Connecticut, where they had a much, where it was a more negatively selected population, a low graduation rate for improvement. They, but they did find positive effects on earnings, smaller than Connecticut, but still substantial. Earnings were about 11% higher and concentrated among males, just as we found in Connecticut with our RD study. They also found evidence of higher marriage rates among these males. The study also made efforts to measure something that they referred to, MDRC referred to, as service contrast through a student survey. And this gets directly at this third pillar, right? We've talked about inner, um, internal validity, external validity, and this third pillar, which is the counterfactual, where they surveyed students to talk about their experience. And so they have measures from surveys about teacher and peer support, motivation in school, and perceptions of relevance of schoolwork that have been answered by both the treatment group and the control group. So let's talk a little bit about this again. We do not need to worry about much about internal validity because of an excellent randomized control trial. There are concerns about external validity, and the first one is the most common one of take up, right? Is again, if the people who take up the program are different than the people who don't, that creates a selection problem, right? More specifically, imagine the people who you, you, you'd have volunteers, they all apply. Some people get offered the program and half of them turn you down. And the ones who turn you down are the ones who realize they weren't gonna get any benefit. And the ones who decided to come in are the, just realize they would benefit a lot. You only measure the effects of the people who take it up you double it because half the people participated in the program and you think there are these large effects for the program, but in fact, it's, it's, it's really exaggerated by the fact that half of the individuals who were treated by the experiment actually wouldn't have gotten any benefit at all and that's why they turned the treatment down. This is much less of a problem here. We had a very high 87% take up rate. Um, another key issue is the analysis of volunteers for new or experimental program may not generalize the population that would participate in at scale program. Even with a very high take up rate among volunteers, it still is a brand new program. It still may be something that, that many people who might participate in a long standing program might view as risky. And so you have a very select sample of volunteers. And even if all the treated people take it up, it might be different than who would show up if you offer it, if you had a program in place, it was permanent, it was gonna last for many years, and it was offered at scale where a large number of people could receive services. Um, and a final issue is important in terms of the counterfactual is that service contrast may not always capture the influence of the program on the counterfactual experience. I had some suggestions of this earlier. The survey findings that MDRC conducted were more focused on sentiment rather than objective information on, on courses or specific career focused learning. So for example, maybe the program raised the general interest in salience of CTE. And so as a result, people who were in the program said really good things about their experience because they had CTE and people who were not in the program said very bad things. Did we, but the people who were, none of the pro, who were in the program wouldn't have said those things if there had never been such a program. Similarly, the people who lost the lottery may be very unhappy 
mostly because they lost the lottery. And they will therefore make more negative statements about the school environment. One way to minimize this problem is to capture more ex objective information through surveys or interviews on exactly what the mechanical experiences and programs were, what the physical documented service was that was provided, as opposed to sort of attitudes on terms of people's experiences and how much they benefited from them. So just to sum up a little, sum up, um, as I said already, internal validity is critical given the opportunities for student selection and simple regression or scoring techniques are insufficient. Many people have the idea that matching or scoring techniques are somehow better than linear regression and, and will get you a long way to having causal estimates. And the truth is, you're just conditioning on exactly the same variables you would have conditioned on in a linear regression. The only thing you're doing is allowing for some nonlinearities. In practice, 20 years of research, those nonlinearities usually don't matter much and matching techniques look a lot like regression techniques and therefore do little to change your internal validity relative to just the linear regression. So if you wouldn't run a linear regression, matching is probably not gonna get you very far. Uh, the external validity issues tend to be very application specific. The effect of volunteers for a program, especially a new or at capacity program, may be different for the effects of a population. Again, estimated effects are only for those who comply with the treatment and the method determines what you're really estimating. Are you estimating the effect for the average student, such as in a randomized control trial, or the marginal student, such as an RD, or something different, um, like the students you move into compliance by moving them closer, if, for example, use distance as a treatment. Or if you have a subsidy as a treatment, people who are more price sensitive are those you'll be measuring um, the, tr the effect of the treatment. Um, and then finally, critically, understanding the counterfactual for treated students if untreated. Um, again, it's really important to try to survey objective information on what the CTE treatment is and what um, the CTE opportunities are for those individuals in the control and untreated. It's great if you can have a bench line for a cohort before there is any program so you can see what things would have been like for these types of individuals if there had been no program. And you always need to think about the influence of launching the program on the control group or untreated ind individuals. That is it. I think I've mostly finished on time, but I'm hoping Kathy will give me a little of your bit of your break if you guys have some questions. <laughs>